Hello, I'm Juan Sebastian Sandoval, one of the OBGAN residents at Duke University, and today we're going to talk about primary aminorrhea. Given that this is a review for the USMLE, we will pay particular attention to the key information that you need to know and obviate details that, although are important for the practice of a gynecologist, are not relevant for these examinations. During this presentation, we're going to define primary amenorrhea, recognize the diagnostic approach for a patient who presents with this condition, and identify its general management. In order to understand this complex subject, first, we need to talk about some important background information. Sexual development or sexual characteristics can be divided into primary and secondary. In general, the former refers to the formation of the gynecological reproductive organs, i.e. external and internal, which take place during embryogenesis, and the latter to the body changes in response to the pubertal hormones, enlargement of breast, which is estrogen dependent, growth of pubic and axillary hair, which is androgen dependent. A very important fact to know is that breast development depends not only in the absolute concentration of estrogen, but in its relative concentration to androgens. Now, when we talk about the development of the primary sexual characteristics of a female, it's important to understand how the ovaries and uterus are formed during embryogenesis. The development of the ovaries and uterus is pretty straightforward if you think of it as a consequence of the lack of a factor that, if present, will convert a potential female structure into male organ. In the case of the ovaries, the missing protein is the testis determining factor, which is coded in the SRY gene, located in the Y chromosome. In other words, the XX genotype, lacking a Y chromosome, will not have the SRY gene, hence, the TDF will not be produced, which will allow the undifferentiated primordial gonads to continue their default differentiation into ovaries. In the case of the uterus, if the Mullerian ducts are present and there is lack of Mullerian inhibitory factor, these structures will continue their default differentiation into the uterus and the superior third of the vagina. While in the meantime, the absence of androgen will allow the Wolfian ducts to involute instead of differentiating into vas deferens, seminal vesicles, epididymis, and efferent ducts. From this, you can infer that genomic abnormalities such as aneuploidies of the sex chromosomes or translocations into an X chromosome of a region containing the SRY gene will affect the function and formation of the gonads and uterus. In summary, the phenotype of the primary sexual characteristics of an individual depend not only on the XX genotype, but also on the integrity of the DNA containing these chromosomes, the presence of undifferentiated embryonic structures with factors responsible for their differentiation, and the adequate function of the receptors of these factors. Depending on where the abnormality is present, the patient could have a wide range of manifestations from being asymptomatic to being a phenotypic female with a male genotype. Now that we know how to recognize primary amenorrhea, Let's talk about its diagnostic approach. There are many elements that need to be present and working properly in order for a woman to have a menstruation. You should think of the hormonal axis between the hypothalamus, hypophysis, and the ovaries and the uterus interacting as a well-working symphonic orchestra. Without the presence of instruments, although the director is capable of conducting the musicians and the musicians are capable of playing music, there will still be no music. The hormonal axis conducts the function of the ovaries which if present and working appropriately, meaning they're ovulating, will induce endometrial changes that will manifest as a menstruation, unless the uterus is absent or has some sort of obstruction. Now, going back to subject, in simple terms, primary means that it has never occurred. An amenorrhea means A, lack or absence of, men, month, rhea, flow. Having all of these in mind, primary amenorrhea is defined as the absence of menstrual bleeding in a person that has never menstruated and that is 14 years old without secondary sexual development or 16 years old with secondary sexual development. Hence, if you have a patient in the exam who has even had one menstrual period in her life, you should not manage her as a primary amenorrhea. 
An 18-year-old female presents to your office. She thinks something is wrong with her because although she is among the tallest girls in her class and her breasts are average size, she has small amounts of pubic hair and is the only one of her friends that has never had a menstruation. She has been sexually active for the past three months but states that she doesn't enjoy it because it's too painful. When asked about her past medical history, she states that her mother once told her that she had some sort of inguinal surgery when she was a toddler. She thinks it was a hernia, but she's not sure. What is the diagnostic approach for this patient? Before anything, a rule of thumb is that any woman at the reproductive age who presents with amenorrhea has to get a pregnancy test. Now that this is clear and carved in your hippocampus, a practical approach to this case is to classify the patient into one of four categories based on the presence or absence of breasts and uterus. Hence, the first step is always to look for any information about the patient's breasts and uterus. Consider ordering an ultrasound as one of your first diagnostic exams. Once that information is available, you can go ahead and classify your patient into one of the following. Breast present and uterus absent. This means there has been development of secondary sexual characteristics. In other words, estrogen is present and there is an adequate relative concentration of estrogen in relationship to androgens. But there has been a failure in the development of some primary sexual characteristics. The next step is to obtain a karyotype. If the result is XY, the patient is a genotypic male with a female phenotype and the diagnosis is androgen insensitivity. There is a malfunction of the testosterone receptors. So, although there is plenty of testosterone being produced by the testes, which are usually intra-abdominal or intra-inguinal, it does not have any effects in the target cells. Hence, there will be no development of the male primary sexual characteristics. A short vagina forms since the urogenital sinus continues its default differentiation to female structures. There is no uterus because Mullerian inhibiting factor is present and breast develop because although it is present in small absolute concentrations, estrogen's functional relative concentration to testosterone is very high. If you think about it, the patient we talked about in the previous slide probably has this diagnosis. Patients will often refer a history of inguinal surgery for hernia when in fact it was an orchiectomy. Of note, orchiectomy should be performed usually after puberty since there is an increased risk of testicular cancer in these patients. Conversely, if the karyotype is XX, the diagnosis is Mullerian agenesis, meaning that ovaries are present, but there is no uterus and the patient has a short vagina. Let's suppose a patient has a uterus present, but the breasts are absent. The next step is to order FSH, which will increase or decrease in response to the negative feedback of ovarian hormones estrogen and inhibin. If elevated, it means there is none or low production of ovarian hormones, the most likely diagnosis is ovarian degenesis or Turner syndrome, which can be confirmed with an exo karyotype. If decreased, it means there is no stimulation for it to be produced, hence that there is a hypothalamic or pituitary failure. In the case of the patients who have absent breasts and uterus, although this is clinically relevant, it is not significant for the USMLE, hence we will not talk about this subject. Patients that have breasts and uterus present in this case, it means that the primary and sexual characteristics have developed. The patient had a normal functioning hormonal axis, but at some point, something went wrong. In this case, you need to do the same workup as for secondary amenorrhea. Since this information should be covered thoroughly in the video for secondary amenorrhea, we will go over this diagram very briefly. After obtaining a pregnancy test, if the patient is not pregnant, we need to obtain a TSH. If elevated, the diagnosis is hypothyroidism. If normal, then the next step is to obtain a prolactin. If elevated, you need to review the medications that the patient is taking. Look for antipsychotics, metoclopramide, or some anticonvulsants. And consider ordering an MRI of the head to look for a prolactinoma. If normal, the next step is to do a progesterone challenge test. By giving progesterone and stopping it suddenly, you are testing for withdrawal bleeding. If positive, which is when there is bleeding, the diagnosis is anovulation. The presence of withdrawal bleeding with the progesterone challenge indicates that there was endometrial proliferation, meaning there is estrogen production, 
but there is a lack of progesterone synthesis, which is produced by the corpus luteum product of ovulation. If there is no withdrawal bleeding, the next step is to do an estrogen and progesterone challenge test. If negative, it means there is an anatomic cause for the menorrhea. There could be an obstruction, such as an imperforate hymen or vaginal septum, or endometrial scarring, such as in Asherman's syndrome. If positive, meaning there is withdrawal bleeding, the next step is to obtain a FSH, which if it's elevated, it means there is no negative feedback. In this case, the diagnosis is ovarian failure. If decreased, there is a hypothalamic pituitary insufficiency and you should consider ordering an MRI. Primary amenorrhea is a very important subject for the USMLE steps 1, 2, and 3. It's defined as the absence of menstrual bleeding in a person that has never menstruated and that is 14 years old without secondary sexual development or 16 years old with secondary sexual development in any female in reproductive age who presents with any form of amenorrhea you can never go wrong if you order a pregnancy test first it is key for this condition to have a complete physical examination considering ordering a pelvic ultrasound as one of your first diagnostic tests in order to be able to classify your patient into one of the previously described groups depending on the presence and or absence of uterus once you have done that proceed with a cascade approach towards diagnosis Finally, don't forget that patients with androgen insensitivity have an increased risk of testicular cancer. They need an orchiectomy, which is usually done after puberty.